His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph to those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is be better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. I was just thinking about this as we, as we go through these unprecedented days and weeks, uh, things that we've never experienced before. And there's, there's a, there's a temptation as we read the papers, as we look at graphs and charts, and as we read numbers, um, there's a temptation to fear and to, to, to wonder what's going to happen. What's, what, what does the future hold? And this morning, I just want to encourage you that the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. We have nothing to fear. We have the Lord Jesus who knows all about this. He knows the situation. He knows uh, all that's going on. He knows the beginning from the end. And we, uh, we look to him. We want to trust in him. We want to take comfort in him. And at the same time, at the same time, we want to recognize that there are so many who are, who are suffering. Uh, there are so many who are, are giving so much. And there is so much to pray for um, this morning. And I want to just direct our thoughts to those, um, first of all, who are sick um, in hospital beds right now and, and who are clinging to life. And, and we, we want to pray for those, those folks. We want to pray for those who are ministering and, and, and serving them in healthcare professions. And we want to pray for those who are, who are uh, um, uh, first-line defenders and, and, uh, and first responders. We want to uh, to pray for them. We want to pray for, um, we want to pray for our fellowship, Forge Road Bible Chapel. And, and as we, as we seek to reach out to one another during the week and, and to connect in whatever ways we can, uh, we want to pray that we would be unified and that we would, we would actually grow through this. Um, and we want to pray for our city, for our state, we want to pray for Governor Hogan. We want to pray for uh, our, our nation, our president and Congress. We pray that they would be unified uh, in, a, in, a, in a spirit uh, that, would be, that would be beneficial to the country. And we just want to pray together, and we want to remember to do that. I was, I was thinking about that. I heard somebody um, who, who mentioned this. I didn't come up with it. But the, as, we, uh, as we spend time every day, um, every day we're, we're washing our hands, we're told to do that over and over again, and we do it more times than we've ever done it before. Um, I just thought it, it, it's, it's a good idea as we're washing, instead of, you know, counting to 20 or singing happy birthday, that we would remember to pray, that we would think about these things and to, to lift them up to the Lord. There's, 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 really, only, uh, there's really only one answer to the, to, to the situation we're in, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And we want to lift these things up to him and pray for those who are suffering, for those who are vulnerable, and we want to do that as often as we can. Let's listen to, uh, we're going to listen to three songs here, and then I'm going to give it over to my brother, Brad Sturm, as he's going to minister the Word of God this morning. Let's, um, before we Before we sing, I just want to, but before we do that, I do want to open in prayer as we, uh, as we fellowship together. Our Father, we thank you. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for this medium that we have. And even though uh, maybe the enemy is trying to break this up, we, we're, we're confident that, uh, uh, that, that, that this is effective. We're confident that you are blessing us as we, as we fellowship together, even remotely. Uh, Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for uh, the love of Jesus Christ that binds us all together, even though we can't touch, even though we can't meet. Lord, we, uh, we, we thank you for, uh, for, for how you've blessed this body. We, pray, we thank you for our brother.
who is going to minister to us this morning. We ask for your blessing on him. And Lord, we thank you for those who are, who are in hospitals and, and clinics all over the world right now and who are giving them themselves. We thank you that they are ministering to uh, the sick and the needy. And we pray for, for them as well. Lord, we pray that you would, that you would, that you would stop this virus. Uh, Lord, you, you're the one that can do it. And we ask for your, for your hand of provision and guidance and healing on us in this difficult time. Lord, I thank you for this morning. And I thank you that we can uh, open the word of God freely, even though uh, we're, we're doing it online, Lord, we can do it and we can rejoice in it. I thank you for my brother. We pray uh, that he would be bold this morning as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're on. Hello, Forge. Uh, I didn't realize that my screen says Paul Dumb. Um, the whole family wanted to say hi. You guys want to say hi? Hi. And um, uh, just wanted, we got some requests to have the whole family here. And we, we, and we sure wish we could see everyone, all, all you participants sitting on the other side. And Lord willing, that'll happen soon. But um, we're super excited to be with you this morning. And uh, just wanted to say hi to a lot of friends that, that mean a lot to us. Also, we just wanted to say thank you for all the encouragement that you send our way. We appreciate all your letters and emails and texts and phone calls and the care packages. I think probably everyone's feet have forged socks on today, so our feet are warm. Thanks to you guys and all the just goodies that you send that show your love. Um, we know that that's just an expression of the love you have for us and the prayers you're offering, but um, we want to say thank you for keeping us in your thoughts and prayers regularly. Yep, so um, say hi everyone, say hi again, and then say goodbye. Hi. <laughs> Trying to do this as seamlessly as possible. Bill and I practiced practiced yesterday, and it was, to say the least, not seamless. Um, so I am going to do what I need to do here. Share screen. Um, good morning again. I'm hoping I don't get a phone call saying something is wrong on the internet. Um, internet has been okay, so we're really thankful to the Lord for, uh, for that. Um, I'll show you where my, my kids just walked. Just briefly to give you an idea. This is the picture out of my front of my window. You might notice a white substance avalanche that is five feet of snow as we finally just breached above freezing during the day but then it freezes at night and it becomes um, a skating rink um, so it's been it's been fun uh, we're kind of in the midst of a snow slash wind storm so we're asking the Lord to uh, be gracious to us and um, Give us some good internet. Uh, so, uh, hello. Uh, the church here in McGrath sends um, very warm greetings to everyone there, and um, and it truly is. It's difficult. To, uh, I was not I was not prepared for uh, the emotional trauma it was going to be. Uh, not being able to visit everyone and go down, and um, I I still talk with Lindsay about. Uh, Josh calling and saying, hey, it looks like things might be, might be not good. You might not be able to come. And I told Lindsay, this is ridiculous. There's no way. There's no, of course we're going to go. And here we are um, in a situation that is, that I don't know, many of us would never have even dreamed was going to happen. Um, and the truth is, it's that situation um, that is kind of brought about on this uh, Palm Sunday, um, brought about the message I would like to share with everyone. Um, and uh, I, I was blessed to be a part of the message last week. And, um, and if everyone out there who I cannot see is wondering if my message will be as long as Kyle's, um, it will not be as long as Kyle's, even though um, 
few people have ever accused me of being brief. Um, I will try to be so today. And um, if anyone is wondering, will my PowerPoint be as good as Kyle's? Um, they will be as good as Kyle's. Um, I have a question. I don't know. I don't, probably is not possible. I want to know if Tom Shetlick is wearing a suit. Uh, I don't know if that's possible. If he can, he's probably not a one of the panelists. But um, I, I'd, I'd like to know that. That's is Tom wearing a suit behind the screen? Um, so what I want to talk about is something that was super encouraging from our church as we studied through uh, the book of Mark, which was a tremendous encouragement to us. We've since finished Mark. Um, we, then we started 1 Corinthians and got partway through 1 Corinthians when all of this happened. And we decided to suspend 1 Corinthians, and now I'm teaching through Romans. Uh, I, actually, I'm specifically teaching through Romans chapter 8. Um, and uh, that's been a super encouraging time. Um, uh, people in the community actually watching these videos that would never have stepped foot in the church. And that also ties into some of what I want to share. Um, as you know, Mark is a super brief um, account of Jesus's life. He moves quickly through it. And what Mark shares and how Mark shares what he shares um, is of great importance. I don't want to say it's not important to the other ones, but with Mark, he is, he is very carefully crafting through the, the placement of the Jesus accounts and even his wording and even what he omits. He is trying to paint a picture and make a point. And, um, uh, I want to share one such point. As we think about these crazy times that we live in, and we've always lived in crazy times, it's just much, much more apparent right now. Um, uh, what, what is the church? What are we supposed to be doing in these very, very difficult times? What is, what is our end game, our goal? What's the goal? What are we aiming at? Um, and what kind of things exist? that can distract us. Um, so I want to look at a story. It's, it's Mark chapter 5. So if you're calling in, um, if you can't see on the screen, I'm going to be putting up the text we're going to be looking at. But if you have your Bibles, you want to open to Mark chapter 5. Our text, what we're going to focus on is Jesus healing the woman in the crowd. Um, but that story of Jesus healing this woman uh, comes kind of interrupting two other stories. Mark chapter 5 is three stories. It's the story of Jesus healing the demoniac, um, this, this man who lives among the tombs with a legion of, of demons that are famously uh, expelled from the man, run into, a, are, are, are allowed to go into a herd of pigs and rush off of a cliff into the water and die. And we, we all know that amazing story. Uh, we're going to look at it just real briefly. Um, on the other bookend is Jesus's interaction with a religious leader, Jairus, who has a daughter who is extremely sick and has um, gone to Jesus and asked him to come with him to heal his daughter, who is at the point of dying. Um, and then right in between these two stories, literally cutting the second half, uh, the second story in half, is this, this interruption into an otherwise seamless story of Jesus crossing a river, meeting this, this man demon-possessed, having his interaction with him, getting right in the boat, crossing a uh, river, crossing the, la the lake, getting to the other side, immediately stepping out, being met by this leader who says, come with me to my house, and then walking to his house, and then boom, interruption is this, is this woman. And uh, in Mark, there are, there are these things like sandwiches. He does it over and over and over again. He divides a story or tells a couple stories that are related, but then he divides it with something in the middle. And, and uh, what he does there when he does that is, is the stories, the two pieces of bread and the sandwich, act as kind of like keys to understanding what is, in Mark's mind, I want you to get this. Don't miss this. Don't miss what is happening 
in this, with the meat of this sandwich. Don't miss it. And, and, and to emphasize it, I'm going to highlight it. To make sure you don't miss it, I'm going to highlight it with stuff that happens on either side. So that's what I want to do with you. I want to, our text that we want to really focus on is, is that interaction with uh, Jesus with the woman. But to get the key, to see what he is surrounding the story with, um, we're going to briefly touch on uh, both sides. So let's continue. Um, I think there is a little bit of a delay. Uh, at least there was last week. So on your screen, you should see the text here. This is Mark chapter 5. A few select verses um, from this famous account. Um, and um, what we have are certain things that that I'd like us to pull out of the text. So I'm just going to go ahead and read this. This is Mark chapter 5, beginning in verse 13. It says, uh, speaking of this demoniac man, he lived among the tombs and no one could bind him anymore. Not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs, and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send him out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission. And then jumping down to verse 17, if you're following along in your Bible. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from the region. Now, this is a group of people, the, the townspeople hear of this, and they come, and they learn of what Jesus has done. And it says, they began to beg Jesus to depart from the region. region. And so Jesus does, and he goes down to his boat to return. And the demon-possessed man... The man who had been possessed with demons begged, begged him that he might be with him. And we know the story. Jesus says, no, um, I would rather you stay here and go back into the community and speak of the mighty works of God, um, God's uh, mercy in your life. And he does that. And so here's what I want to pull out. Again, we're not studying this deep, and there is a lot we could study here, but that's not our text. But here's what I want to see. Here's this demoniac man. He has an insurmountable problem. Um, chains, shackles, chains, um, all of these broken into pieces, night and day, cutting himself with stones, crying out. No one could, no one could help him living among the tombs. An insurmountable problem. Legions uh, of, of demons um, possessing this man. No one is able to help. Um, no one could bind him. No one had the strength to subdue him. There was nothing anyone could do. I would like you to notice that he sees Jesus from afar. He sees Jesus far away. Just put that in the back of your mind. He comes before Jesus and he falls down before him. And repeatedly, he begs Jesus. Now, it's a little strange here, I will, I will admit, because for part of the conversation, Jesus is speaking with demons. Um, and really, we're not going to learn too much, necessarily. We're not going to put into practice how demons talk to Jesus, except for the fact that we have no recorded case in the Bible of a demon um, directly disobeying Jesus. In that, when Jesus tells a demon to do something, he does it. Um, uh, in fact, demons throughout the gospel are constantly proclaiming the truth. They know who Jesus is. They say it. They submit to him. They do exactly what he tells them. Uh, that granted, they don't love him and they can't stand him and, and they are evil. Um, but they know who their creator is. 
And um, so here we have repeatedly um, this idea of, of as Jesus interacts with the demoniac man, he, the demoniac man is begging, adjuring him all the way to the end when, when Jesus leaves. And there is this relationship established, this love, this, this former um, demon-possessed man wants to have a, wants to be with Jesus, begs Jesus. It's Mark says he begs him in, in verse 18 that he might be with him. Let me be with you. Um, and let me go with you. Let me get in the boat with you, please, Jesus. And Jesus um, says, no, um, stay here and be a witness to me. And um, so those are the things I want to pull out. Now, let's go to the other side. Um, what we're going to do here is look at um, the story of Jairus. And so if you have your Bibles, I've now jumped to verse 22 in Mark chapter 5, verse 22. Um, and I'm going to read, I'm going to read verses 22 to 23. And again, if you're not, if you, if you're calling in, then I'm going to read verses 35 to 42, because our text cuts this story in half. That's, that's why we'll have that break. So I'm going to begin reading in verse 22. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house someone who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue. And Jesus saw commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking. For she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. So here's some things, like we did with the demoniac. What can we pull out of this? Can we, what do I want us to see? Similarities between these two pieces of bread in Mark's sandwich. First off, she has an insurmountable problem. She is to the point of dying. Uh, this man believes that Jesus is his only hope. And in fact, before Jesus can get there, news comes that she is indeed dead. Insurmountable problem. In fact, all the people around Jesus also recognize it. She's dead. No one can help. Why bother the teacher anymore? So that's the other thing. No one is able to help. Jesus is, the, is, is really the only hope here. Now note also that he sees Jesus. Um, and he also comes before Jesus and falls at his feet. And he also implores Jesus earnestly. And then Mark goes to, um, goes to a, a great extent to paint this picture of this kind of intimate interaction. When Jesus comes to the house, he's, he takes only a few of his disciples with him and tells all the rest of the crowd to go away. And he goes forward, and then he comes into this room where there's all this weeping and wailing. And he's got the, the, the little girl's father and mother with him. And, and he sends everyone out of the room as well. And so now he has this kind of intimate uh, setting with a few of his disciples standing in the corner and this girl's father and mother. And then there is immediate and complete total healing instantaneously this girl who was dead is 
is healed. Gets up, starts walking around. Jesus tells her to get something to eat. Um, and so we have these kind of similar, very similar elements between these two pictures, uh, which at first glance is, is not super important, if not for the fact that we have another story that cuts these two stories right in half. So let's go to our text. Again, here on the side of the screen, we have kind of these two lists, and they're extremely similar. Insurmountable problems. No one is able to help. Sees Jesus, runs and falls down before him, implores, begs earnestly Jesus, explains the situation to him, receives total healing, and there is the establishment of this of this relationship. When he takes the little girl by the hand, he calls her his daughter. Um, and Talitha Kumi, uh, interestingly enough, like I said, there's more that we could be studying there if that was our text, but it's not. But that, that means little lamb. Rise, little lamb. And there's this intimate relationship there uh, that is built. Um, so, but this is our text that um, I would like to share with you. If you're Reading in your Bibles, um, this is Mark chapter 5, verses 24 through 34. And this is the text, text that I'd like to spend some, some, a little bit of time on. Um, so let's just go ahead and read it and do the same thing. Pull out uh, some details. So Jesus has um, been, had this encounter with Jairus and has now left Jairus and is walking to Jairus' home where he's going to have the encounter with uh, the little girl. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus. And she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Now, interesting, in the text, there is a pause here. Um, the story seems to kind of have ended a little bit. And so if we were to make a similar list, we have great similarities and then some, some differences that jump off, of, jump off the pages here. This woman also has an insurmountable problem. Um, she has been bleeding for 12 years and, and, and it's just like Mark to throw these little details in there. I mean, this is, this is Mark who skips over the, 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 the insignificant detail that Peter got out of a boat and walked on water. He didn't even mention that. It's not his point. He, there's huge things that he just feels like he doesn't need to mention. Um, yet he mentions that this woman has been suffering for 12 years. And he also mentions that the little girl who is healed um, is 12 years old. Um, and what he is doing is he is causing the reader to stop and say, see a connection here. Make connections. You are allowed to make connections between what is happening. Look at the details, Brad. That's what he's doing. Causes, ah, what's going on here? And she had an insurmountable problem, suffering from many physicians. She's, physicians cannot help her. Her wealth cannot help her. In fact, every, all of the resources she has at her disposal only make the situation worse. Rather than getting better, it is getting worse. So she has an insurmountable problem, but then her story begins to diverge from the story of the other people. And you probably caught it. It says, rather than seeing Jesus or seeing him from afar, she hears reports of him. And what, what Mark is doing is he is beginning to set this woman's interaction with Jesus apart from the other two in a, he's distancing her. He's keeping her from having to interact with him. She's, he's keeping this woman from having to engage Jesus, from having to come before him and speak with Jesus. 
He's keeping her interaction impersonal. She doesn't see him. She's not waiting. She's not looking for him. She hears the reports of this Jesus. Oh, I've heard of that guy. And rather than running up and coming before Jesus and falling at his feet, she comes up behind him. She sneaks up behind Jesus in this crowd. And she has no communication with him. All she does is reach out and touch his garment. For she feels, if I'm, even if I'm able to touch his garment, I will be made well. She's heard reports that in Jesus is great hope. No one else can help me. Last ditch effort. Jesus, you're my solution. You're the solution to my problem. You're the solution. I'm going to come up to you. I really am not interested in joining the group and the people that are thronging. I'd rather just sneak in, come up behind you, get what I need, and get out of there. And we see that the story stops, and we're allowed to focus on those little details because Jesus, Jesus kind of like flips out. And you can't see it in the text. I mean, you can see it in the text if you slow down and really look at the details and paint a picture. So this is what happens. She realizes that she has immediate, immediate healing of her disease. So if we make a bullet point of this woman, she has an insurmountable problem that no one can help, she hears about Jesus, she sneaks up behind Jesus and receives total healing. It's a different list that looks starkly different and is missing some really big bullet points. And those bullet points, Jesus won't have. And he stops and our story continues. Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And the disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came. Now I want to pause there because I want to get a picture. I want to get a picture of what's going on here. I want to see what was happening in that crowd moving down the street, thronging around Jesus, pulsing around Jesus, pressing in on every side. I want to see what was happening there. And we could, we could mistakenly get the idea that um, uh, Jesus was walking down the street a woman sneaks up behind him and touches his robe. He feels that power has gone out with him. He says, who touched me? And there's standing this woman. And, he's, and oh, the disciples are like, what do you mean who touched you? He says, someone touched me. Uh, and the woman's standing there. And he has this conversation with her. And our story ends. But the reality is, I think more was happening there. I think it was probably more like this. I think Jesus is walking down the street. People thronging around him. and. And this woman comes up, sneaks up there, touches his garment, feels that she is healed, and turns and starts, starts weaving through the crowd to get out of there. And she's, she's walking, and she's some distance away, and she can hear off in the distance the man that just healed her screaming, Who touched me? Who touched me? Now, where is that? In, it's, it's in the text. It says he turned about in the crowd. He's turning about. It's not, it's not one turn. This is a, what, what is going on? Who touched me? To the point where his disciples have to say, what, what, what is wrong with you, Jesus? Everyone's touching you. There's a massive crowd thronging around you. Why are you, why are you, why are you making this, this big show? There's tons of people touching you. And so he looks around and, and, and repeats. He looks around to see who had done it. Who touched me? Who touched me? Jesus, calm down. Are you, what is wrong? This is fantastic. You're losing your mind here. You're getting all worked up. Uh, power went out of you. You healed someone. That's great. Fantastic. That's what we're here to do. That's what we're going to do right now. That's what we did on the other side of the lake. That's what we're about to do with Jairus. You just did it. You didn't even realize. I mean, that's fantastic. Why are you freaking out? We got crowds. We're, we're the center of attention. We're the show everyone wants to see. This is great. And what is the big deal? Who touched me? And the woman, 
is sneaking through the crowd off and she hears because she has to come look at the text but the woman knowing what had happened to her came in fear she has to come back and she's like she probably every time she hears she who touched me and she hears that oh let me get out of here what did i do and she's trying to get out of there and he won't have it crowd stopped big scene power does not come out of me without interaction without a relationship i won't have it i am not an atm machine i am not some magic genie in a bottle i'm not your three wishes i am your friend your brother your king who touched me and so our story continues but the woman knowing what had happened to her came in fear and trembling and now it changes this woman comes in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth and he said to her daughter your faith has made you well go in peace and be healed of your disease she was already healed of, his, of her disease we could have moved on but he wasn't going to have her bullet point list missing these two pinnacle points so you can see we can add that to that she has an insurmountable problem that no one could help yes she heard about jesus yes she snuck up behind jesus yes she received total healing but jesus would not let that list end there and so he turns about in a big crowd that's all there because of what jesus can do and screams even though people don't understand why he's screaming who touched me until this woman comes back kneels before jesus speaks with jesus and is his daughter the same word he uses when he says talitha kumi he calls her his, his his little daughter the relationship is established now you can go we cannot miss that and there's there's really two big perspectives here one is this woman and 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 and, it, and it, i think it's pretty obvious here this woman comes thinking she can have what she assumes to be her biggest problem fixed there's no it's insurmountable it's very very difficult it's physical it's temporal it's um I, I have no other recourse i see in jesus power the ability to maybe get me out of this problem but i really don't have any other intentions not looking for a savior i'm not looking for a friend i'm not looking for any of that I'm not looking for a relationship i'm looking for my problem to get solved and so she comes and is confronted with the reality of her real problem Jesus, this this man will not have it and you can hear her fear and trembling and she comes and kneels before the lord and has a conversation with him and so she gets to have have um, this wonderful peace and healing in her life but the other perspective and it's the one that i think maybe is even more important is the perspective of the disciples because everything jesus is doing he's doing with these crowds and specifically his disciples around him as he heals different people as he speaks with different people it's always being done in different ways he does a miracle he does he never casts out demons the same way he never heals the blind people the same way he never touches people his interactions sometimes he spits on the ground sometimes he doesn't even have to be there sometimes he touches them by the hand sometimes it's instantaneous sometimes oh it's i can see people but they're like trees walking oh i mean another one you know what is he's always teaching us something he's always getting the disciples who are standing standing in the corner standing in the corner up in jairus's room 
standing back watching Jesus interact with this demoniac, standing here in the crowd watching Jesus scream, who touched me? And they're asking themselves, what is the big deal? And Jesus, knowing this, is doing these things to get the disciples to ask those exact questions. And if we're going to be good disciples, we'll ask the same questions. What are you trying to put in the disciples? Get them to realize. And that perspective is the perspective that I, I think is so applicable today. Um, what are the disciples all excited about? Getting the massive problems that exist in the world fixed. Look at what we're able to do. Look at what the world sees in us. I, I'm sure like, like many of you, I, I, um, I've seen, I, I spent some time surfing news articles, seeing the latest thing, what's been banned, what, you know, all, all that kind of stuff, what's going on with um, COVID-19 and all that stuff. And as I, as I scan through stuff, I found, as maybe some of you have, several articles talking about how this time has like, is this causing the next great awakening? Majority of Americans are praying. Um, uh, people turning to the church. Um, is this a, a, a national revival? Um, more and more people are becoming religious. Uh, stuff like that. I'm sure you've seen articles like that. I have all of those are um, articles that that I've I've seen. Not, not those are not the exact titles to the words. I'm sure they could come up with better titles. But that was the gist of all of those: praying, religious, great awakening, revival, all that kind of stuff. Um, I've seen multiple things, and, and so the reality is there are throngs, throngs of people, multitudes of people that have heard of this other resource that's out there god jesus church you heard that some pretty crazy things sometimes can happen there people people talk to this guy and there are people in this world who i think are going to gather and probably are gathering tremendous fear uh, people hurting, people dying, no cures, things like that, forcing people to come with insurmountable problems. And one of the resources they've heard that maybe they could tap into is us, is the church. And here's the, here's the reality, they're right. They're right. It's like the it's like the father with the child with the child who is was demon possessed in, in Mark chapter nine. You know, if you can help me, please, please. And she's if if I can help you, there's, there's no question. If I can, of course I can help you. I can do anything. But that's not the big issue. The big issue is, do you know what your problem is? And what Jesus is trying to get these disciples to see is, yeah, it's great that people are here. That's fantastic that people are here. It's cool that they see the power of the Lord. It's cool that they see power in the church. It's cool that they see us as a resource. It's cool that we're then able to turn around and let power come out of us, help people who have many more problems than just this. Um, just, just people I have in my life right now that I am in a relationship with because of problems in their life. A lot of you have been praying for my friend, Josh. I, Brad, I remember you. I've talked to Josh in 20 years. Like, get a text. My family's fallen apart. I've gone to counseling. I've spoken with tons and tons of people, read books, gone to conferences. My family's about to leave. I'm going to lose everything. I have nowhere to turn. And I remembered you, my friend, from when we were in junior high. And I remembered that you had, and he kept calling God the good Lord. I remember you had a relationship with the good Lord. And I got nowhere else to turn. And he finds me on Facebook. I've got a, uh, a guy, a dear friend of mine right now who is, who is growing, uh, hopefully, with his relationship with the Lord right now. And he knocked on my door um, addicted. He got nothing else to do. I've gone through programs. I'm kicked out of my house. I just lost my job. I've got nothing else to do. They told me. 
that you're the pastor, you're the preacher, is what he called me the preacher. You're the preacher in town? I've got nowhere else to go. There are lonely people, sick people, hurting people, families falling apart, people financially hurting. Um, there, we have no shortage of insurmountable problems to which people rightfully come to the church. Because while we're not God, um, and I always think of Tom when, when Tom says it's his kind of big beef with the what would Jesus do movement, you know, Jesus would just heal him. And I'm not Jesus, I can't do that. And I, I agree with that. Um, uh, but Jesus would use the resources at his disposal. And to that extent, I can. I'm sure Tom would agree with that. Um, I will use what resources are at my disposal. The Lord's given me financial resources. The Lord's given me direct access to the throne of grace. Um, uh, the Lord's given me a new heart and compassion for people. Um, uh, the Lord's given me uh, knowledge and insight into his word. Any resource I have, I will use that. And the church can come and find power. I mean, the world with its problems can come and find power. They're right in coming. But we cannot be content with that. Because Jesus was not content with that. Who touched me? Power goes out. Problems get solved. But I am about relationship it's all for not the party stops the crowd halts where it is and i will turn about and i will fight tooth and nail until the person comes back and stands before me and talks to me and hears me call them a little girl you are my daughter you're my daughter you get that kneel before me know who i am have a relationship with me we got that relationship you talk to me We've got this, I'll hug you, you're my little lamb, you're my little girl. Won't you? I'll take the demoniac by the shoulders and I'll give him a big hug and I'll put, you gotta talk about me here. I'll be back, I'll be back, we'll see each other again. But you go tell people, all right, all right, friend, I wanna be with you. Do we have that? And the woman, yeah, okay, we've got that. Now you can go in peace. And it's like he turns to his disciples and says to his disciples, don't get wrapped up in the fact that tons of throngs of people are coming to you with their problems. Don't even get wrapped up in the fact that you've got some pretty good answers to that problem. Your end game, your goal must be getting people to have a relationship with me or it's for naught. People with insurmountable problems will go back and will continue to die of their true and real insurmountable problem. And so I want, I want to be a person, I want the church to be a church that sees this as opportunity to show the world it needs to come before, kneel before, Beg, implore, talk to, tell the whole truth to Jesus. And hear him say to them, you're my friend, you're my little lamb, you're my daughter, you're my son. Have that relationship. Not just have the faith of the man and of the, the demon-possessed boy in Mark chapter 9. I believe, like this woman, I believe, I believe that if I touch your robe, I get healed. Help my unbelief. There's more than that. I want you to believe that I am the treasure of the universe, that I am lovely and worth falling in love with. And if your bleeding doesn't stop, or if COVID takes you, or your son never wakes up from, 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 from the ground, uh, never gets up off the ground, uh, am I, are you still happy you came to me? And so what does the church do? What do we do? Um, who touched us? Um, there are absolutely going to be situations where we're just going to shine. You know, you're going to 
crop past someone in the grocery store. You're not going to have time to sit down with them and give them a big Bible study or something like that. Um, and you're just going to be kind. And you're just going to love people. And that's going to happen. But the, the question that, that this text is bringing up is, what is our mentality? Is that all we're shooting for? A good image? A lot of people that are happy with us? Fixing the testimony of the church and the world? Or are we shooting for people coming and growing in their relationship with the Lord? Establishing a relationship with the Lord? Are we content with fixing problems? And we need to think about, as we look to fixing problems, and there is power that we are to use. We are to help people and comfort people. Absolutely, we, we are. But as we do those things in the back of our minds, or the very forefront of our minds, excuse me, is, Dad, would you use this to show them that he's your son, he's your daughter, that you love him? Would you do this to establish that relationship, to free them from sin? To, to solve what is truly their most insurmountable problem, which is that they don't have a relationship with you. Would you give them one? Use this situation. Let me, be, let me be more than just a doctor. Let me be more than, than, than just a resource. Um, let me introduce them to your son. And uh, it's a mentality that I believe his church must have. And um, we would be good to ask the questions and sit down together and talk. Like I'm, I'm isolated in my house. I don't know how to get out. How do I do that? I, I don't really have all those answers. This is super, super new to me. Sitting in, staring at a computer screen is really, really new. Um, but, but we're going to figure it out. And we're going to talk to God. How, how? Show me. Open up doors. Give me opportunities. What can we do? How can we get your gospel out there? How can we get people right now to see Jesus and to run up to him and to share the whole truth with him, kneeling before him and hear him say, you're, you're my son or you're my daughter. And so we need to think about that. Talk to him. Talk with each other. Be strategic. But at the, at the core, we need to have this mentality. We're not content with just being seen as good people who can get things fixed. Um, so um, I really appreciate your time. Um, I hope that this is uh, encouraging to you. I hope it stirs some things inside people, maybe even get some uh, conversation going and, and stuff like that. And a conversation that I am sure is already going on. Um, but maybe fan that flame a little bit more. Maybe that's what um, my prayer for this message would be. So let's, um, Paul, I see you jumping in there. Um, can I pray to conclude that right there and then hand it to you, Paul? Okay, cool. Dad, thank you so much for, again, this medium. It is so cool to be able to do this. And so we praise you for it. And um, thank you for your word. Thank you for your relentless commitment to establishing loving and intimate relationships with your creatures. Um, give us wisdom to know how to do that, to see opportunities to do that, to make opportunities to do that, and guard us from ever being content with simply solving earthly problems. But let us be people who see the desperate need that people have, the very real need people have, physical need people have, especially today. And let us be wise in knowing how to help be compassionate, loving people who ultimately want to see this world fall in love with Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. There we go. If, uh, thank you, Brad, for sharing with us today. It was wonderful to hear the, the, the word of God and how, uh, how much we need him and how he's the answer. Um, I, as we close, I just wanted to read something. Um, the governor of Maryland has written, uh, has written this, and it's, um, it's interesting. He says, throughout history, people have come together during times of great challenge and uncertainty in prayer and reflection for the good of mankind. And it's in that spirit of solidarity and reflection that on Sunday at noon, April 5th, 2020, all Marylanders are asked to reflect in unity and prayer for the victims of the COVID-19 pandemic and for those risking their lives to care and provide for others. 
And in response to this worldwide crisis, our nation has seen extraordinary heroism and sacrifice from our first line responders, including doctors, nurses, and emergency personnel, essential workers from all walks of life. And Maryland unites in solemn respect and gratitude to pay homage to those who so courageously continue to do all that's within their power to heal and support our nation during this pandemic. Therefore, I, Lawrence, Junior Governor of the State of the Maryland, to hereby proclaim Sunday at noon, April 5th, 2020, as a moment of prayer and reflection in Maryland and to commend this observance to all our citizens. We're a few minutes late. It's interesting and, and, and gratifying to know that uh, even, even our politicians know from whence our help actually comes. And uh, they know that uh, they can't solve this insurmountable problem. Um, but as Brad said, our prayer is that we would be able to bridge the gap between this desire to reach out uh, to something greater than ourselves and uh, an introduction to the actual Savior. And, uh, and that's our job. Let's spend a few minutes in prayer and then we'll close. Our Father, we thank you this morning for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that um, in him we have our life and our breath and our, and our be very being. And Lord, we, we, we look to you today in this time of crisis, even as our, our governor has asked, we, we unite today in prayer and, and thanksgiving for those who are, who are risking their lives, for those who are working um, harder than we can imagine, uh, for those who are seeking uh, a cure. And, and Lord, we just uh, lift these things up to you. This is an insurmountable problem. Um, but Lord, we know that you are the God who can do anything and that you greatly desire for us to see you, to hear you, to, to reach out to you, to run to you, to fall before you. And we do that this afternoon. And we ask that you would heal our nation and this world that you, would, uh, that you would stop the virus, the pandemic. And Lord, I, even more importantly, that, that we as a body of Christ would be able to reach out to our neighbors, would be able to, 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 to show them the one who, who really can solve the problem. The problem is not the virus. The problem is, is our separation from you. And Lord, we want to show everyone we know, the love of Jesus Christ. Lord, this morning we, uh, we look to you, we lift these things up. We thank you that we can join together in prayer and worship and study of the word. And we can do this uh, in an unusual way, but Lord, it's gratifying nonetheless. We thank you so much for all you've done in our lives. And we lift these things up in the name of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you for being with us this morning and have a great week.